All right. Hey, I'm uh, Joe from Paragon Sports. I'm here with Timmy O'Neill uh, from Patagonia, and we're uh, here to ask him a couple questions. I guess let's get started. Okay, um, let's do this. Awesome. Um, so I'm from Jersey, and my first climbing experience was in Red Rocks, Nevada. Where did you get your first taste of climbing? First my climb. first climbing experience was in Bozeman, Montana, wow. at Highlight Canyon, and I was working in Yellowstone National Park, and they had a free climbing day given by Northern Lights. Oh, this wow. climbing store and I went and took the class and I was hooked. I was like, wow, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life, which means be self underemployed. Yes, absolutely. It's going well. Dirt bag forever. Yeah, pretty absolutely. Much. Yeah, lots of sores, scabs, <laughs> hunger in hunger. many ways. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, um, Joe. So, um, uh, when and how did you first become involved with Patagonia? Um, how, and how have climbing sponsorships evolved? the sport of rock climbing, which is... That's a two-part question, two Joe. Question. Does that count as two questions it, or as one? It's one question, it's two parts. One question with two parts. So let me get 50% of that one. All right, when okay. did you first start with Patagonia? I first started working with Patagonia creatively when I would open up the catalog as a child, as a young, young guy, and look at these pictures of these beautiful places around the world, of these individuals doing these wild wilderness adventures. And I wanted to be in those pictures. And oddly enough, uh, decades would pass. I would start working with the brand as one of their ambassadors. And then I would also go to a lot of those places that inspired me as a kid when I would look through the catalog. That's awesome. That's really, really awesome. That's a good answer, too. Now the 50%. The next one, how have climbing sponsorships changed? The sport. The, yeah. the sport of climbing? Yeah. I mean, they've allowed people to make somewhat of a living. You know, like it allows people to work with different brands out there and help with development of product and help with development of stories and then their exchanges they can help you take trips via travel budget you can have reciprocity through actually being paid you know to represent the brand so i think it's it's changed it in a positive way in a positive way okay you think it's a positive mostly way. for me mostly for you okay yeah yeah. Clearly. Yeah. It's awesome. Um, and every time I say the word Patagonia, I get 50 cents. Patagonia, 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 Patagonia. That's $2 right there. I'll be saying it every other word at tonight's show. It's still not train fare, though. You need well, three, three or five yeah, Patagonias. Five Patagonias, fare. and I'll be able to take the train. Awesome. Patagonia. I got enough money for the train. That was two extra. Done. Thanks, Joe. You're great with math. You know that? Oh, He's really you. good with math. I get paid for that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, um, third one. So you spent a lot of time with Tommy on El Cap and in big walls in general. Um, what are some of the challenges that set big wall climbing apart from your standard multi-pitch? Well, if you have a standard multi-pitch, is that three pitches, we'll say, standard? Maybe five. El Capitan is 30 plus pitches. So that's a big difference right there, mm -hmm. 30 pitches. And then another aspect of your standard multi-pitch climb may be that you're not going to camp on it. So that absence of having these big haul bags and vertical camping up there, which we need to have more vertical camping. Completely agree. Yeah. So that Absolutely. would be, those are some differences right there. So over the last few years, I was obsessively following the progress on the Dawn Wall. Um, if, did you spend any time with Kevin and Tommy during that period while they were working on this project? I was sending them letters. You're sending them letters? I was letters. writing them letters uh, and then sending them up the wall by carrier pigeon and they would read them and they would become inspired. I was sort of like a pigeon-carried guru for them. It was special. I would also uh, send them quantum messages using quarks, leptons, and gluons. No matter where I was in the world or the multiverse, they knew I was there with them. That's pretty special. Thank you. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's pretty unique. So in other words, no, I spent no time with them no time with on them. the wall, but I, I do applaud them. Um, so I, I can't free solo a 5.6 without getting the shakes. Um, Are you sure you can't? <laughs> I've tried it a few times, yeah, absolutely. You don't want to try to free solo. You either want to free solo or, or never not. do it, right? Because if you try and free solo and fail, it could be catastrophic. Absolutely. <laughs> right. Um, so, and, and if you do decide to fail, fail really early on, like at the car or in bed right. that day, those are great places to fail, <laughs> free soloing. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean... Uh, so what type, what type of person free solos? I mean, you free soloed the Chicago Tribune Tower, and you I have a history of it yourself. I have been known to climb without a rope, but that's when I was really poor and I couldn't afford one. Now that things are going better, I have a rope and I use it all the time. Excellent. That's good to hear. That's not true. <laughs> I didn't think it was that's true either. True. That's not true. <laughs> I mean, free soloing is a very personal act because it's 
causing you to have a great risk assessment and really know that you're able to climb this particular rock without falling because falling isn't an option. Oh, it's an option, but it's a really, really bad one. Absolutely. So, so you avoid. confidence is sort of everything. You, confidence you, is good, and, and I prefer uh, a roll-on antiperspirant uh, because I don't want to be sweating up there when I have the rings, and I see that I have the ring, and other people maybe can see that I have the ring, and then I could start shaking more. Absolutely. That's not true. Next question, Joe. <laughs> Let's awesome. do this. Um, in addition to climbing, you also slackline. Uh, can you yeah. tell me more about the evolution of slacklining? Like, how did it start, and why is it a climber's sport? Uh, slacklining started when somebody took a rope and put it between two points. And I don't know when that was, but it was somebody that was most likely looking for something to do. And that's what they did. And then it evolved into a balance exercise. And then it became, maybe like 10 years ago, it really started to become popular. Mm -hmm. And now it's ev evolved into a whole trick culture. Right. It's pretty incredible. There's a company called Gibbon that yeah. has these competitions around the world, in fact. Yeah. Crazy Andy. Uh, sketchy Andy. Sketchy yeah, Andy, sorry. Sketchy, sketchy cra Andy. But if you called him Crazy Andy, it'd be Crandy, which is like a craisin, <laughs> which is like a cranberry and a raisin. So what if his name was Scrazen? That'd be Sketchy Andy and a raisin. <laughs> um, so I can't, I can't really talk about soloing and slacklining without mentioning Dean. Um, yeah. So you, you knew him. Um, you got the speed, uh, a speed record on the nose together. Um, can you tell me more about your relationship or, um, or anything to say about Dean in general? Let's have a moment of silence, Joe. Ready? Let's do it. All right. That was for Dean Potter. It was a moment of silence right there. Mm -hmm. Dean, if you're out there, and I know you are, <coughs> hear that raven flying by right now? Love you, dude. You're an incredible climber, an incredible person, and you'll be missed deeply. Next question, Joe. Thank you. Thank um, you. In the film Valley Uprising, a main focus was the on-again, off-again relationship between park police and climbers, um, especially in regard to freebasing or wingsuit flying. Um, how do you think this recent tragedy will affect this relationship, and do you ever see a day where uh, flying is legal in Yosemite Valley? I don't know if uh, base jumping will be legal in Yosemite. I, knew, I know that they do have, I believe it's one day a month where you're able to jump off of Glacier Point Correct. with a hang glider. Okay. So that is less of an aberrant behavior. It's more accepted. So I think if people can, and this would be the Park Service in particular, mm -hmm. they could pass a mandate that would say, we feel that base jumping has legitimacy for these individuals that's not based on an external bottom line that convention dictates has value, but we're gonna honor an internal bottom line that an individual creates, then, then base jumping could be legal, perhaps. But I think really what the important thing is to realize is that there's, I think, five million people a year that come to Yosemite, and there's just a few dozen that wanna use the park in a certain way. So five million against five dozen it aren't great odds to have your voice heard. Mm -hmm. So maybe we need to have more people base jumping. I can't disagree. Maybe we need to have five million base jumpers go to Yosemite and just start jumping one after the other. It'll fill the prisons, it'll jam the court, <laughs> and then they'll have to say, wait, forget it all. Let's just make it legal. Let's join them, and let's get the park service to base jump El, Capi El Capitan together. And that's going to be great. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess finally, you started Paradox Sports, not Paragon Sports. Um, can you tell us more about what that is and what your goals are with, with the company? Uh, Paradox Sports is an organization based in Colorado, but that does national programming around disability. So if your arm is missing and you want to climb, if your sight is missing and you want to kayak, if you have a traumatic brain injury and you want to go climb a mountain, then we create programming and curriculum around that. And then our goal is to have people not recognize difference necessarily, but recognize an inclusivity, that somebody's life isn't over if they're missing something or if they have some traumatic accident, but that it's just a different life that's begun in a new way. Wow. That's, all, that's really all I got for you today, Timmy. Thank cool. you so much for coming around. Well,